and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and death shall be no more, nor crying, nor mourning, nor sorrow shall be any more, for the former things are passed away. In consequence of the redemption, of which the conception of Most Holy Mary has assured us, the tears which sin has caused to flow from the eyes of the mortals shall be dried. Those that avail themselves of the mercy of the Most High, of the blood and merits of His Son, of His mysteries and sacraments, of the treasures of His Church, of the intercession of His Mother, there is no more death, no sorrow, no tears, since the death of sin and all that resulted from sin is abolished and has ceased. The true mourning is now left to the sons of perdition that dwell in the abyss whence there is no deliverance. The sorrows of labor are not a mourning, not a true sorrow, but only an apparent one, entirely compatible with the true and the highest kind of joy. For when accepted with submission, it is of inestimable value, and the Son of God chose it as a loving pledge for himself, his mother, and his brethren. Nor will there be heard any clamor, nor the voice of quarrel, for the just and the wise, following the example of their master and of his most humble mother, must learn to bear themselves with silence, like the artless lamb, when it is slaughtered as victim of the sacrifice. They must renounce the right of our weak nature to vent itself in cries and to complain, seeing that His Majesty, their Supreme Lord and Model, was slaughtered on the frightful cross in order to repair the damages wrought by our impatience and want of confidence. Why should our human nature be permitted to complain of labor and trouble in view of such an example? Or how can hateful distinction and uncharitable sentiments be allowed among men when Christ has come to establish the law of eternal charity? The evangelist repeats, And sorrow shall be no more. For if any sorrows remained among men, they are those of a bad conscience. But as a remedy of this kind of sorrow, there is the sweet medicine of the incarnation of the Word in the womb of the Most Holy Mary, so that now this sorrow is become acceptable and the cause of rejoicing, not any more meriting the name of sorrow and containing within itself the highest and the sincerest joy. With its introduction, the first things have passed away, namely, the sorrows and the useless hardships of the ancient laws, which are now sweetened and assuaged by the abundance of grace in the new law. Therefore, he adds, And behold, I make all things new. This voice proceeded from the one who is seated on the throne, because he declares himself as the artificer of all the mysteries of the new law of the gospel. Since all this newness was to begin with such an unheard of and such an inconceivable event as the incarnation of the only begotten of the Father and the preservation of the virginity of his mother, it was necessary that just as in all things, so in this mother there should be nothing old and worn out. But original sin clearly is as old as visible nature, and if the mother of the incarnate word was to be infected with it, he would not have made all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these things are most faithful and true. And he said to me, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. According to our way of speaking, God was deeply grieved because the great works of love performed for us in the Incarnation and Redemption should be so much forgotten. And as a remembrance of these great benefits, and as a satisfaction for our ingratitude, he commands them to be written. 
Therefore, men should write them in their hearts, and should begin to dread the offence which they commit against God by their gross and execrable forgetfulness. Although it is true that the Catholics believe and trust in these mysteries, Yet by the contempt which they show in their want of esteem for them and in their forgetfulness, they seem tacitly to repudiate them, living as if they did not believe them. Protesting against their foul ingratitude, the Lord says, For these things are most faithful and true. Let the torpid and listless mortals in their sloth and listlessness understand that these words are most faithful as well as most powerful to stir the human heart from its stupidity as soon as they become fixed in the memory, pondered and revolved in the mind as the most certain truth. For God has made them true for each one of us. But as God does not repent of his gifts, and does not retract the good which he confers, even if man makes himself unworthy, he says, it is done. As if he wanted to say to us that although by our ingratitude we have offended him, he will not turn back from his course of love, but having already sent into the world the most holy Mary, free from original sin, all that pertains to the Incarnation is already an accomplished fact. Since the Most Pure Mary was now on earth, it appeared impossible that the Divine Word should remain in heaven and not come to earth in order to assume human flesh in the womb of the Virgin. And he assured us again, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last letter, the beginning and the end, including the perfection of all things. For if I give them a beginning, it is for the purpose of raising them to the perfection of their ultimate end. This I will do through Christ and Mary, commencing and perfecting in them all the works of grace. In man I will raise and draw all creatures toward me as to their last end and their center where they shall find repose. 